Hi, my name is Stas and welcome to This Is My Architecture. Today we have Bernie from Ultimus. Hi Bernie, how about you tell me a bit more about what you do? Certainly, Ultimus is a financial data management company. Uh, we consume index and ETF data on a global basis and we send that in a standardized format down to financial institutions. Mm -hmm. Interesting, so can't wait to deep dive on the architecture. Um, could you tell me about how data is being ingested, first of all? Certainly, as in we have in excess of 200 different providers of data. This comes in via various methods. So obviously the bog, bog standard methodology is FTP. Um, we consume all the data and send it into Lambda and the Lambda actually writes it into S3. Additionally, we also receive a lot of the data via email. We use the email SES to set, also send that directly into S3 as well. Got it, so nice. So emails come in, SES takes the attachment probably and just pushes that as an object to S3. Yes. Okay. And in terms of this Lambda function over here, is there any kind of interesting processing going on? Yes, as in one of the big issues that we've got is because we've got so many different providers, all who are updating their data at different times of the day, we're storing within S3 every version of that data. So what we actually do is, within the Lambda functionality, when we actually go to write it into S3, we actually call against the DynamoDB table, validate uh, via checksum if we've already received that file. If we've already received it, we don't store it. Mm -hmm. If it's a brand new file that we've never seen before, we store it in S3, and then that kicks off the rest of the downstream process. God, well, it's a cool way to kind of manage changes and make sure you're only pulling you know, things that are actually different. Nice. What happens in terms of the actual transformation? Uh, yes, as in once uh, it's actually been stored in S3, we actually call Lambda again. The Lambda actually then writes the file directly into the DynamoDB, so we've got a, for, uh, we've got a complete form of when, how that uh, file originally arrived. Mm -hmm. um, again, once the, that file is actually in DynamoDB, it calls Lambda again. And one of the major aspects behind this, and the reason why we're using Lambda, is the sheer volume and spikiness of the data that we receive. Um, like we can receive, when financial markets close, we receive up to two, 300,000 indices mm -hmm. all in one go. Obviously, Lambda allows us to scale. So when we actually are processing that data, we do all validations, checksums, uh, ground up calculations, ensuring that the financial data is accurate. Mm -hmm. And we then take that data in from all those various providers and store it back in as a standardized format back into Dynamo. Mm -hmm. Got it. So I like how you know the data is processed. You use Dynamo to be a bit like you know, staging tables, you process it, you, you know, there's building back and forth, and then it's put into Dynamo in its, in its final form, essentially. Yes. Cool, so I understand how data is ingested, how it's stored. Uh, can you tell me a bit more about what happens from the point of view of the user? Certainly, as in, I think one of the major parts that really drove us down this architecture route was the idea about the resiliency side. So, as in, we use Route 53 quite extensively. Um, both from a latency point of view, so in other words, dependent on where the uh, user's actually coming from, mm -hmm. uh, they come against Route 53, and then Route 53 decides which one of these paths it actually takes. Um, so as in, from our point of view, the, the system is always performant to the user, mm -hmm. they're able to get the data in a timely manner, but also, this also allows us from a resiliency point of view to shut down various platforms. If we need to make any changes, we've got the option of routing everybody from one side of our platform to the other mm -hmm. without the user noticing. Got it, so basically if you want to, you can do uh, you know, regional deployments almost and then kind of push users Correct. to different regions. Got it. And just one challenge that you know, it's quite quite common. Well, how do you replicate the data between different database systems, or uh, DynamoDB in this case? For us, as in, fortunately, DynamoDB has got uh, global tables, which is obviously a two-way replication. We can quite easily, anything that's written into here gets uh, immediately replicated there, and vice versa, meaning it's all seamless to our users. Mm -hmm. Got it, interesting. And so users, um, do users mostly use the API, or what type of functionality is, you know, uh, made available to them. Again, coming back down to the fact that the, our users are very interested in verifying and ensuring that any processes that we do aren't impacting their data. So we also allow them access to the raw files. Mm -hmm. So these users can also come through directly and access the raw data, mm -hmm. not only through the API, but they can actually get the CSV, text file, Excel files, whatever it is that we receive via these methods directly from our S3 bucket as well. Mm -hmm. Got it. And in terms of, so it, it looks like AWS, uh, 
or your users are kind of accessing a number of different AWS services. How do you deal with authentication, for example, for the API gateway bit? And again, I think one of the major parts from our side is it's not just the API gateway. We use the API gateway to generate the API key, but we then use that to give the clients access to our whole environment. And again, on a global basis, so be it S3, the API, however they're accessing it in whichever region, they use the same API key, and they then have access to the whole of our platform. Got it. Well, Bernie, this was really interesting, and thanks so much for sharing. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us with This Is My Architecture.